At this point, Mary Lou is going to introduce Larry, but we do have two other VIPs with us here. His cousin Angie's here, and his sister Joanne is here. So, welcome. All right, Mary Lou. Okay, well, I was going to drag this out, but I was reminded that there's a time limit. So, I've known Larry for a really long time. Um, we both taught in Anne Arundel County, and when I um, left el uh, elementary school and went to middle school, guess what? Larry was also teaching there, and I will say, this is the good stuff, that uh, he was a wonderful science teacher, and uh, I was a math teacher, and in, in those years, the math and science people were back together. Um, so he did teach science for 40 years in the county. He also was the president of the Anne Arundel County Bird Club and um, Wake Audubon in uh, North Carolina. Now, just to say that um, uh, we sort of lost track for a while because he retired and went to North Carolina. I'm still in Aunt, uh, Howard County, but uh, really in Ann Rundle too. But because of the, the Zoom meetings, um, we reconnected. I guess it was an Ann Rundle Zoom meeting. So uh, we sort of had our own little Zoom meet and uh, uh, I don't know, just a few weeks after we had we connected over Zoom. So Larry was asking me, um, have you done any traveling? And I said, oh yes, I've gone to the Grand Canyon with my son and Florida. And I thought, well, that was really great. So then I said to Larry, so have you done any traveling? <laughs> yeah, all seven continents. <laughs> oh. Okay, so much for the Grand Canyon. So he's well traveled, <laughs> and uh, yes, that was I, I still totally remember that uh, comment. It's like, oh, yeah, so you know, <laughs> so he's done a lot of traveling, uh, a lot of it with his wife Diane. And I learned a term, term from him, ecotourism, which, which I had no idea what it was until whenever. Um, he's presently the Wake Audubon Educational Outreach Chairperson, and um, uh, we're delighted to have him here today to talk about um, burning in India, and um, because it's a long talk, I'm going to introduce him to get started. Yeah, because India is a big place. <laughs> Is it possible to turn? Is it possible to turn some of the lights down? As you see, a lot better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always like that when when somebody's showing me something. And I think I'll stand here so it's easy to get my photogenic face. The camera will follow you. Oh yeah, yeah. That's kind of creepy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, only only if, if, if David is in the oh, yeah, only yeah. only if the lovely assistant is. Uh, Sitting down. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you turn the lights off on this side instead of in the back? Yeah. Yeah. And picky. Uh, it doesn't matter to me, but you know, it's going to interfere with uh, the quality of the pictures. That's better, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, uh, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, I know a lot of outstanding Howard County birders. Uh, Mary Lou's not one of them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the story I always tell about her is that uh, she went with my uh, teenage sons that are in their 50s and upper 40s now. And we were at Hawk Mountain, and she couldn't distinguish a Cooper's Hawk from a Sharp Shin Hawk. So a Cooper's Hawk was right over her head, and it was being harassed by three Sharp Shins, and they were, you know, flaring their tails and all. And she says, Oh, I don't know. And so my son says, she's never going to get it. 
<laughs> I'm sure she has it now. Uh, thanks for giving, this is my disclaimer part of the talk. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak about the trip I took to India in 2022. I'd like to make a disclaimer right at the beginning. I spent three weeks in India and traveled to a lot of visiting parks in the Northeast and Central India. Most of the time was spent out in natural areas with few people. We did spend a considerable amount of time in airports, traveling by car and meeting people that ran the lodges where we stayed. My observations are based on the snapshot of an immense country of 1.2 billion people. My observations are based on my experience and does not make me any kind of expert about India. But I can tell you, India is a fascinating place. I've been all over the world and it's one of my favorites. It's just a great place to go and they do a nice job with their national parks. I went to Kazaranga, Kaliodea. I went to the Shambhal River. I went to Banahavgar. And then I ended up at uh, Kana. And just so you know where they are, I uh, took a map. And uh, actually, two is the first thing I did. I flew into there. I used to plane. And then from there, <laughs> after an overnight, we got on a plane and flew over near uh, Kazaringa, and we were there for three or four days, and then we had to take a long car ride back to the airport and back to New Delhi, and then we drove down to Kaliodea, which is near Bharatpur, if you know India, and then from there we drove over to the Chambal River area. And that's where we saw most of the Indian people because it wasn't so much a national park as you had to drive through a ton of towns. There are a lot of Indian people there. <laughs> uh, then we drove up to Agra, where the Red Port and the Taj Mahal, because you can't go to India without seeing the Taj Mahal. And then we went back up to Delhi and flew down to Ban Havgard. And after Ban Havgard, we flew over to uh, Kana. And then from Kana, we went directly home. Well, directly isn't actually the word. <laughs> so Kazaringa the sand a little bit over here. Um, the economy of Kazaringa is dependent on tea. You see the tea plantation and rice. But since I was at the height of the summer of the dry season, they weren't growing a lot of rice because there wasn't any water. And ecotourism is a big part. And the National Park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And you'll find out why. First, there's a lot of Asian elephants. Here's a bull. And you know what the bird is next to him? Cattle acre, right? <laughs> and uh, there's an Asian female uh, elephant. And you could distinguish them because they had smaller ears and they were relatively smaller compared to the African elephant. But they're still huge. And I don't like to personify nature. But honest to goodness, when they were in eating water hyacinths, they looked really happy. I mean... <laughs> They did. They looked happy. And they had a cool technique. They would pull the water hyacinths up, squish it in the water, and then they would wring it and then eat it. And they were doing that constantly. And they were having a great time. Notice if you've been to Africa, that elephant had pretty well intact tusks. Where African elephants use their tusks so much, you often see a break. There's also the greater one-horned rhinos. And they're, that's the largest of the rhino species. And Kazaringa has two thirds of the surviving population. And the people in that area recognize what a draw and how a, what a special treasure, uh, treasure it is. So they're very protective. Uh, you can see uh, there's a male with a water lettuce, you know, on on his bill. And uh, they also had like dip, dimples on their uh, their posterior. And it seemed to be because particularly the male would bash them on the, on the butt. <laughs> and I think they had to have a, a harder rear end just to not have any kind of damage. There were also wild buffalo. And one of the things that was a theme in India is you'd often see the precursor to animals that we know, like cattle and chickens. Uh, and in this case, this is wild buffalo. And that horn spread is at least six to eight feet. They're enormous. When, they'd go, when the males would go to a wallow, they would fill the wallow. It was something else. Um, and there's about 1,400 at Kasaringa and uh, Indian wild boars with piglets. 
I like that. I like any time you can sow young with the uh, boars, and there were a lot of them, and they were pretty common almost all the places we went. And then I was taking a picture of eastern swamp deer, and when I looked at it, you know how you look at your camera? I go, what are those things? And it, what it was is a whole troop of smooth-coated otters were just going from one of the ponds to the next. And I didn't actually take that picture for that, but I'll take it. <laughs> uh, we were in the dry season, but in Casaringa, if there was a, a lot of shade, there was mud. And it wasn't common in all the other parts, but there I am standing with the uh, trip leader, Dave Davenport, waiting for them to get our uh, Jeep out of that rut. It didn't happen often, but when it did, it was uh, a delay. And of course, when you're delayed, you can still look for birds. You can always look for birds. <laughs> and there were three kinds of deer that were surviving in the park and thriving. There were hog deer, which are pretty small, and they slope down toward the front. The samba deer, that looks like it has um, the old brush that you use to put shade cream on. And they're pretty big and muscular. And then swamp deer, which reminded me of white-tailed deer, except that their rack was much more extensive. And uh, in this case, remember this one, because see how it's a really nice color, roan? Well, watch them when you see them in another ecosystem and how they are the same deer, but they look really different. And this is the reason why we can have Bengal tigers, lots to eat. <laughs> Rhesus macaques were common in this park and uh, uh, they had body language similar to humans, like this mother and infant. Um, that little monkey had come close to me. I was sitting on a porch and it went and it came right over to mom do you recognize that mom stare? Yeah. <laughs> so look. Yeah. Now, um, there are also Western Hulock gibbons, and they were really nice. And when the alpha male and female start hooting, the rest join in. And when you were at one place, you could hear the Hulock gibbons miles away because it really carried. And I'm going to try to see if I can get it to play. Um, if it doesn't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time working on it. But I actually recorded it, and let's see if it'll match up. Oh, I know. Wouldn't that make a nice ringtone? <laughs> <laughs> it would. You would hear it, wouldn't you? Because it's unusual. Uh, lots of birds. I'm there for the birds. Uh, I mean, I don't mind seeing tigers, but if you gave me a choice between five birds and one tiger, I'll take the five birds every single time. There were little egrets that were very similar to our snowy egret, Asian open builds. Uh, we saw a flock of them that were repeatedly probing slowly into the water hyacinth marsh, and they were doing it kind of synchronized in an area about 50 feet long, and it was gorgeous. It really was. We saw spot-billed pelicans, and I noticed that they were much smaller than our white pelicans. And then there were black-necked storks, but you didn't see a lot of them, but you'd almost always see two of them, and they'd be in within sight of each other. <clears throat> there was the Asian coel, which I think is a lot like our crow. I think it fits that niche. And I liked it because it had a really loud song that went, for real, for real. <laughs> and I'd go, yes, for real. <laughs> and then the Asian paradise flycatcher. The male has a crazy long tail. It's at least two or three feet long. And it's not a very big bird. So when it flies, it really does look like a tennis ball with a streamer on the back. <laughs> but talk about an elaborate display to attract a mate. And then kingfishers. How many yeah. like kingfishers? Yeah, me too. Well, you'll be really happy there because there's lots of different kinds of kingfishers. And the stork bill had a, a substantial bill, and uh, it was easy identification. Look at those colors. But look at the white-throated kingfisher. What threw me off was the first couple that I saw, I saw from the back, and it's a bright blue. So right off, I thought, well, they're stork because I'm not familiar with, you know, the birds I've just gotten there. 
And when they turn, they show that white throat and I was surprised. But they were pretty common because Kazaringa is part forest, but it's almost all marsh from a really large river that regularly overflows and uh, reinvigorates the marsh. Yeah. Uh, here's a spot-billed duck. Any idea why they call it a spot-billed duck? <laughs> okay, and uh, white-breasted water hens. And they prefer thick cover close to water. And anytime you were near even a small pond, you would usually see these. And you see how these two are real upset? I'll show you a little later on why they were upset. Uh, red whiskered bulbuls, a lot of different kind of bulbuls, and they're very distinctive and they're fairly loud. Um, the Asian pied starling. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day because had a breeding plume is Eurasian starling. We go, oh, starling. But if you travel the world, starlings are some of the most gorgeous birds you're going to see. And that was an Asian pied starling, and you often saw it near people. There's the spotted owlets and the crested serpent eagle. Can you uh, see the uh, snake that he's got in his talons? Yeah, I always thought if you're gonna see something that's called serpent eagle, it'd be nice to have a serpent. <laughs> and, and they were fairly car a common uh, bird of prey. Oop. That's me. Oh, okay. He's messing with me. <laughs> okay, and then... Oops. Uh -oh. yeah. What did I do? What did you? Uh, I, I, I know how to put it back on. You good, me. good. <laughs> I'm a quick learner. There's the Indochina roller. So think <laughs> of Eastern India and then into the uh, Pacific Asian countries. That's where you're going to see the Indochina roller. And how many have seen a lilac breasted roller in Africa? This one's every bit as pretty. And when it would, you know, fly, it spread its wings. <laughs> That blue was as blue as this young lady's um, shirt. I mean, it just knocked you over. Um, when you go farther west, uh, then we were uh, seeing one that almost looked identical to me, but they were known as the Indian roller. And then the lenny-headed barbet, a, a pretty substantial bird, a little bit bigger than a crow. And it had a repeated call that you could hear from a quite a long distance. The gray-headed shrike. I really like strikes, and um, I live in North Carolina. They're not that uncommon, which is really neat. And we had chestnut-headed uh, bee eaters, and they prefer forests in the vicinity of water. And we saw a lot of different kind of bee eaters. We saw a Baja uh, weaver bird, and we were stopped in traffic, and I saw it, and I took that picture out of the window. You can see where one hanging basket is already done, and they're weaving the second one. And it's, it was a lucky shot because we only stopped for about, you know, 10 seconds. And here's a rose ring parakeet, pretty good size. And it's a female because it doesn't have the thin pink uh, necklace. And it was coming out of a burrow. Hmm. And then orchids. We were at the height of the dry season and it was extremely hot. So guess what? We didn't see a whole lot of orchids. <laughs> we mainly saw them around the uh, safari lodges because they water the plants. And uh, the foxtail orchids, I really like because it's a combination of a whole lot of little orchids. And then here's the second one where I put a paragraph down to make sure I said it correctly. But look at that traffic. When I talked to uh, Indian and Pakistani friends of mine, I said, when you go back home, because a lot of them are recent immigrants, I said, do you ever drive? And they all say the same thing. Oh, no, we'd never drive. And I think that you really have to live in India for quite a long period of time to understand the rules of the road. So here's what I like to say about it. One of the aspects of traveling in a country not your own is the opportunity to observe, observe what you can see from out your car window. You know, I had people that said, oh, it's a five-hour car ride. It's a five-hour car ride in a place you've never been. One of the things I liked is, particularly at Chambal, when you were going down, we were in a van that time, and uh, they could they would be walking along, and it was all Indians, no Caucasians that I saw. And so they'd look in the van, and they'd see this big white guy, and they'd do a double take, and I'd wave at him. They would wave back and smile. That's really affirmative, isn't it? 
That's a really nice country. Um, uh, several countries I've traveled to have challenging traffic, like Australia with its reversed traffic lanes and at times narrow uh, roads. Chinese traffic is just massive. And I think they make up their own rules. And our tour bus rotated who sat in the front seat in China because it was too terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> have you been there? And the Indian traffic takes it to a whole new level. What can you expect to see on the road? At some time, you'll see the following. Cars, trucks of all sizes, people, people pushing ancient carts, cattle drawn carts, cattle, goats, chicken, wildlife, tiny taxis. We had a game going on it. Who could see a taxi? You've seen the little tiny Indian taxis? How many people they could put in a taxi? And our record was 12 people in one of those. But well, we also saw motorbikes, lots of cars again, uh, vehicles driving on the wrong side of the road. Even for them, it was on the wrong side of the road. And farm vehicles that would have these enormous loads in, on them. But the miracle is that everything works. Sure, there were traffic jams and near misses, but the only accident I saw was the tr a truck uh, right down on the bottom right. And I think what happened is they had a, such a heavy load on top I think they had to stop really fast for a cow in the road, yeah. and the, the momentum made it flip upside down. And it's the only accident I saw with a massive amount of cars. And um, on one of the photos, you can barely read the sign on the back of the truck. What does it say? Blow horn. Blow horn. Now, if somebody beats you, are you offended? Yeah. Yes. You want to offend Indians, don't blow your horn. You know, that when you're coming to pass or you they don't think you know, they blow the horn. And we got used to it toward the end, but right off, it was it was uh, jarring. An Indian friend of mine on one of my monthly bird walks told me that the greatest aspect of India is to see how men, how so many people from so many walks of life get along and exercise a tremendous amount of cooperation. And he was right. And it was a really nice thing for him to tell me before I went. And it was an adventure every time we got in a car. So from there, uh, we flew back to New Delhi and then took a high-speed highway. And I said, great, for once we're making really good time. And then about halfway there, we got off into the little narrow road going through the little towns with their traffic jams. And once again, I was enjoying what I saw. I went to Kaliodea National Park. It's near Barakpur. And uh, do you know the birds? Sars cranes. And what is their claim to fame? They're the tallest bird that can fly. Um, and here is Man Singh, a rickshaw driver, and my friend Lex Bakarik. Uh, Sin Singh was 57 years old and very happy to be able to pedal us around Caliodea after COVID restrictions were just lifted. And I found out real quickly, it's just like if you're in a car and there's birds all around, if you can, what do you want to do? Get out of the car. And they, they had no problem. Lex really liked uh, somebody driving her around. But uh, the tour leader, it's called EcoQuest. I've gone on a lot of trips with this guy. He likes to vary the trip. So we've already gone in Jeeps. Now we're in rickshaws. See what other things that he has me in. Yeah. And we saw a lot of spotted deer. Here's a stag and a doe. They're a little bit smaller than a white-tailed deer. They're also known as chill, axis, and Bengal tiger food. <laughs> and there were lots of them. Here's a blue bull or a nilgay, and it means blue cow, and it's the largest Asian antelope. antelope. It was, it's horse size. And the, the tiny thing was a three-striped palm squirrel, which reminds us of a, a lengthy-looking uh, chipmunk, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, by the way, today I was up in Pennsylvania. I took a picture of a chipmunk because where I live in North Carolina, no chipmunks. Hmm. And also very few woodchucks or groundhogs. Come to my house. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but in North Carolina, I, maybe it's the clay. I really think it's the clay. And they m mostly eat nuts and fruit. Um, here's a black winged stilt chick. No, not black neck, but black winged stilt chick. And the black winged stilt parent 
was constantly telling this chick to come over here. And uh, look at the legs on that little bird and uh, pretty big feet. And then uh, I like wading birds a lot. I hope you do too, because there were a lot of black necked ibis. There were a lot of Indian pond herons, which reminded me about the size of a green heron. They were difficult to take a picture. Have you ever noticed that yourself? That some birds, it's just hard to get a good picture. Number one on my list is crow. They just don't have the definition to make a good picture. And then purple swamp hen. And I think it's just a purple gallinue that took steroids. <laughs> and one of the reasons it was so easy to see it is that we're at the end of the dry season. So the pools had gotten smaller and smaller and the fish got more and more concentrated. We saw the graded painted snipe and there's the female who's prettier than the male. And guess who has to stay with the eggs? The male, yeah. That's nice, and boy, he never left her side. And it, that's why they're looking like in the same place, because he was right behind her. Uh, there's the purple heron, which reminded me in size of a tricolored heron. And it preferred to forage in and near cover by itself, where the gray heron, which reminded me of, of course, the great blue heron, but with a lot more white, um, it, you notice it's on a nest with young, and it often hunt, hunts out in the open and waits patiently for fish. Then there's the saurus cranes, and uh, I chose this one because even though the, the child's not with them, child, the young's not with them, but uh, can anybody name the other two white birds in there? Spoonbill. Spoonbill. And a little egret. Yeah. yeah. And, and then there's that, uh, and, and they're the tallest flying bird, 152, 156 centimeters. And then there's the painted stork, which I think is one of the most lovely storks I've ever seen. Would you like to see a really ugly one? <laughs> oh, by the way, remember the uh, black wing stilts that were upset? Uh, it was too close to their nest. And when they would fly at it, you could hear the uh, bill snapping, trying to catch that bird. Uh, here are some starlings. I love the attitude of the top Bremeny starling. You looking at me? I think it's from Brooklyn. And uh, then really large yellow-footed green pigeons, really well named. And uh, they're also a pest with where they're ra raising fruit. And then here's a green bee eater and a white-eared uh, bobo. And the bobo reminded me a lot of uh, the noisiness of a mockingbird. And from there, we moved to the Chambal River Safari Lodge. And uh, it was a really nice place. And the food, how many like to eat Indian food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for 20 days? Yeah, OK, good. I'm with you. But um, toward the end of the trip, I asked the lodge, the, and Khan, I asked the lodge person, I said, hey, because we're Americans, are you making it mild? And she goes, oh, yeah. And I said, I don't know what's happened to me, but as I've gotten older, spice doesn't bother me at all. I can eat wasabi <laughs> with a spoon, you know. I said, could you give me some at the next meal? I just want to see what your spice level is. And so I got my own food, and the rest of the group said, uh, oh, I want some too. I said, no, you do not. <laughs> and the nice thing is the spice was really great, but the bad thing is that's all you could taste, you know. Okay, that's a Chambo River Safari Lodge. I could tell you about the ants in my room, but you don't hear that. Um, one of the nice things about Chambo is we we're in with the people. It wasn't a compound, you know, to speak of. And we saw a lot of people biking, walking, and these two ladies that were working on a crop. Now, in the dry season, how did they have green vegetation? Uh, drip irrigation, okay? And uh, one of the things I like too is they were sharing the latest news. You could just tell. And uh, they were always active early. And when we came back from a, a nighttime safari on the river, there were a hundred times more people in the town. And it makes sense. And in fact, a lot of people were taking their uh, lattice bed and they put it outside because it wasn't gonna rain and it was cooler than being in the building. Made sense to me. 
Uh, and so when you're going along, one of the things you'll see is a dry cow dump because, you know, they leave the cows alone. The cows go all over the place. The cows still produce cow patties, don't they? So what they would do, look down on the ground. Do you see the fresh cow patties? They made them into cow patty frisbees. And then once they dry, they start this pattern. You can see the pattern very well. And when they completed a really big uh, group of uh, cow patties, they would put a thatch hut over it. So when the rainy season came, it wouldn't get the cow dung uh, too liquidy. And they're used for cooking, heating, and making adobe. And I thought, well, maybe that's part of the reason why Indian food tasted different in India than it did at an Indian restaurant here. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of small towns had a variety of small businesses. And here is obviously a street produce market. But uh, I love seeing what they were doing. Look at that one. And they, you know, selling all the way through the day and into the night. And I believe they would wheel it back to their house in the, in the late evening. And here's India's... Uh, version of McDonald's. <laughs> and during the heat, many people shopped after the sun went down. Um, the small businesses tried to stand out from their competitors. And uh, this region that we are in, Chambal, is really big in brick making. I mean, you see these towers that go way up to cook the bricks, and then they sit it out and dry it. And then people, at every place I went, people had stacks of bricks. And sometimes they were using the bricks, and sometimes I think they were just stockpiling bricks. And I think it's a currency. Um, and then minas. Have you ever had a mina? Yeah, did you ever teach it to a wolf whistle? Big mistake, okay. But up in um, Kazarenga, we saw jungle minas. Uh, we saw common minas pretty well everywhere. And along the banks of the Chambo River, we saw the bank mina. mina. And uh, they're somewhat dependent on habitat and region. Um, at Chambal, they had a large colony of Indian flying fox. And when they would take off toward the evening, they would go over to a pond and take several gulps of water before they went off to uh, eat some fruit. And they would fl uh, fly out to feed at night. And then this is the thing, one of the reasons I went to India I cannot believe a bird that big and that ornate can walk around without getting eaten the minute it's walking around. But are you familiar with turkeys? And in the evening, where do they go? Way up in the trees, and so do the peacocks. So when you'd go early, you'd hear that call. <laughs> and to me, it sounds kind of like a scream. And uh, they were up there because I think if they were down at night and some of the... Uh, nocturnal predators are out, I don't think we'd have peacocks. Um, there was a red wattle lapwing, which is a pretty common a bird, a lot like our, well, you know lapwings, but it's a lot like our analysis to a killdeer. And this one was making a lot of sounds, and I looked, and there's the little wet red wattle lapwing chick. And it was in a uh, irrigated area. Uh, jungle babblers. If you run into a bunch of jungle babblers, you'll find out why they're called babblers. They all get excited and start streaking around you. And uh, then there's the Indian hare, really large veins to help them lose the heat. And then we saw Indian scops owls and uh, spotted owlets. I like that one's winking at us. And then we went on our deluxe, deluxe, no expense, you know, the Chambal River cruise. <laughs> and uh, we went on a morning and an evening uh, cruise, and we had two of these deluxe boats that were capable at least two miles an hour, okay? <laughs> and one of the things that we were looking for, because the Chambal River is part of the Gange River Delta, you know, uh, river system, is we were looking for Gange River dolphins. They're much smaller than the dolphins that we see, and they're pink, and they have more of a bulbous head up front. And have you ever tried to take a picture of uh, bottlenose dolphins at the ocean? Well, try it where it comes up over there, and then it comes up over there, and it comes up for a fraction of a second. So this is my picture off the internet, so you can see a uh, Ganges River dolphin, but really cool. By the way, the reason that picture was taken is our deluxe boat broke down within about 50 feet of where we were supposed to come out. So we're just waiting. And uh, uh, let's see, yeah, right there. 
Oh, I have to hold it. All right. That was our guide that stayed with us. We always have a native guide that stays the whole trip. And no, that's the native, the guy that stayed the whole time. This one's a local. And then these two people, the person waiting and her husband, they were in my boat. And uh, have you ever birded with somebody that gets louder, nearer the bird? I did not want to be in that boat. Um, there were a lot of knob-billed ducks, but they don't have knobs because it wasn't breeding season. And lesser whistling ducks. And have you ever noticed how sharp-looking whistling ducks look? Yeah. yeah, well, there were a lot of them here. And uh, they ate a lot of marsh plants and submerged vegetation. Here's the golden jackal. And you know how they say, oh, you're a jackal. Jackals are really cool, kind of like coyote. And what I liked was hearing them howl at night. I kind of picked up my pace. And here is a blue bull or nilgay down at the river. And look for size. Look at the bulbous whistling duck. Well, the, the whistling duck, the lesser whistling ducks. Isn't that something? I thought the evening travel where we're covering the same part of the river would be repetitive. Well, any of you know that if you come down the river in the evening, it's a whole different show, isn't it? And uh, here's a striated heron and a pied kingfisher. So if you like kingfishers, here's another one. It's black and white kingfisher, and it preferred slow-moving water. And one of the freakiest-looking storks I've ever seen was a woolly neck stork. And they don't really wade in the water too often. What they like to do is they like to hunt the dry and wet grasslands to snap up prey. And then there, here's a Eurasian spoonbill that sweeps side to side to sift for prey. It's, it's smaller than our spoonbill. And this is one of the reasons I was excited about uh, the Chamba River. We got to see Gariol crocodiles. They get up to 24 feet long. Yeah. Now, we only saw 18 footers. So. <laughs> but um, one of the reasons they got their name is it reminds the Indians of a snout that reminds them of a pot. And the pot is called a gara. And um, would you worry about a gara, gario, cro you know, crocodile trying to eat you? They really don't eat you. Uh, now they have 110 interlocking teeth, but it's for fish. It's not for people. In fact, uh, uh, if they tried to attack you, well, you'd be in trouble. But um, they'd be in trouble too because their jaw is a lot more fragile than you think. And there's only, they're only in about 2% of their original range. So I was really happy to see them. Isn't that nice? And then the mugger crocodiles. And they feed on fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And they dig burrows to avoid hot and cold temperatures. Reminds you of an of a alligator, doesn't it? Yeah. And then here's the great thick knee. Look at the eye. Don't you think he looks stressed out? Because he nests and lives in full sun on rocky outcrops in rivers where the gariol and mugger crocodiles are. <laughs> they, you know, I, you know it's, I, I don't see how they do it. And then there was a common green shank that frequent the fresh and saltwater habitats. And I just had to put a picture. I, this is the only time I've ever seen somebody washing a camel in the river. You know, pretty neat. Oh, by the way, there are a lot of camels in India. Do you know that? And I think they have the largest camel races in India. Yeah, when we were driving, we'd go, camels. And I go, it's not a bird. <laughs> uh, now, you see the mugger crocodile and the great thick knee? Yeah. Now, that was during the day. In the evening, where we saw no people at the water, but down in the evening, these teenagers with a chaperone, uh, we're standing on the rock where the mugger crocodile had been. And what's the girl on the right doing? She's taking a selfie. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, oh, okay. And then uh, leaving the Chamba River, uh, we drove up to the Red Fort. And uh, it's really a walled city. And almost all of it is occupied by the army. And the part we saw, there wasn't a lot of the ornate decorations that you would have expected when the Shah was in charge. But one of the things that did survive intact was the Hall of Public Audience. And I like how there's a repeating power, um, you know, palette of uh, scalloped archways. It's really nice, isn't it? 
And uh, of course, you have to see the Taj Mahal. If you're there and you want to see the Taj Mahal, find out the earliest time you can get there because there's a lot less crowds. The sunlight's better because that marble is really something else. And the third thing is, it turns out a lot of rich women come with their photographer to get their picture taken early in the morning, which is really kind of cool. Um, how many have seen the Taj Mahal? Okay, were you surprised it's not as big as you thought it was? <clears throat> See, I thought it was something like huge. And it's not like a shack, <laughs> obviously, but it's not near as big as I thought it was. And it was built in memory of his wife, Mumtaz Mahal, and they're both interred inside. So what you're really looking at is a big mausoleum for two people. And uh, by the way, his son, the Shah that did that, uh, Shah Jahan, he was overthrown by his son. There was an awful lot of family battles for succession. And he didn't kill his father, but he kept him in the Red Fort, and he put him in a room where he could see the Taj Mahal. And uh, Mumtaz was not the only wife he had. He had wives of three major religions trying to say, I'm for all of those religions. You know, here's a Taj Mahal through a scrolled archway, and I like repeating patterns, so you can really see that a lot. Uh, and from there, we went back to New Delhi and got on a plane and flew down within a five-hour car drive of Van Hofgaard. And it's near uh, a national park and a tiger reserve. And Bengal tigers approaching and passing by us. Our guys had a general idea of where to find Bengal tigers. The tigers seemed, for the most part, undisturbed by our presence. If you stayed in the vehicles, they ignored us. That's the big if part, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the three people you see off to the right are the, the Balicki family, uh, husband and wife and a sister. And they're within 10 feet of a really large Bengal tiger. I was taking a picture because if they charged, I got like a National Geographic thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, there were brown fish owls, at least as big as a great horned owl, and a white-naped woodpecker. And it's one of many golden colored woodpeckers. And I asked the guy, I said, why do they call it white nape when it has that gold on the side? And he says, a lot of them have gold on the side, but only one of them has a white nape. And then my favorite vulture of all time. Isn't that a cool looking vulture? <laughs> Egyptian vulture. And uh, this is an adult. And uh, I actually think that it looks like Uncle Morty. Doesn't that? <laughs> look at it. Doesn't that look like Uncle Morty? And then an Indian vulture. And uh, we know that vultures perform the necessary task of removing the dead. Now, this is the ugliest stork I've ever seen. And I've seen a marabou stork, and they're pretty ugly, too. And that's a subjective thing. You know, all God's creatures are beautiful. But, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, um, by the way, this is a fierce predator. There were lessers, and we also saw graders. And uh, then, this is a Shelley Balicki photograph, because mine didn't do that well. Uh, here's a, a male, and the female is walled into the tree cavity during the breeding season, and it depends on the male for food. And if the male dies, she's going to die, and the chicks will die. Yeah. And wouldn't you say, well, why doesn't she peck her way out? She can't get her head far enough back to deliver a, a, a substantial blow. So uh, talk about dependent on uh, male tenacity. Oh, it's a really big bird, by the way. I mean, that's what made it easy to find. Um, and here's, here's, here's my tiger. See, I'm very bird-centric, and I like to see a tiger, but I don't want to sit and look at a great big pussycat, you know, swat flies off and just lay there for hours. And so we were at a place where, uh, I'll make it really brief, but... Uh, there were supposed to be two people in my Jeep, but one of the people couldn't go. And then when they tried to rearrange, the Indian National Park Police wouldn't let them move somebody into my Jeep. So I had my own Jeep. I had an Indian driver, a local guide, and then another guide. And uh, this one time, we're waiting for a tiger to come out of tall grass. And it was like an hour and a half they were going to do it. And he whispered to me, and he says, do you want to stay? And I said, no, we don't want to stay. 
So we were going looking at, oh, kind of neat birds because we were going at a birder's pace, right? And guess what came up to us? <laughs> that tiger. And so at lunch, they said, oh, we saw a paw one time and a tail. And I showed them the pictures. And uh, the first picture, by the way, this is a female and she sent Mark in a tree stump. And then the Bengal tiger female was up on a rocky outcrop, which I think was pretty cool. They're guar. This is another one of those animals that there's a, an analogous animal in, in our domestication, cattle. But these uh, cattle have never been uh, domesticated, and that's a small one. They really look like they work out at Gold's Gym every single day. I mean, I've never seen such a muscular animal. And they're huge, but uh, with under certain conditions, a tiger can bring it down. In fact, we went to a, a guar kill, and you could tell you were getting there because about a half, a half a mile away, you could smell it. Mm -hmm. But you could also see the, the tiger would come back. And now here's that swamp deer. Remember the first swamp deer? Look how different they look. And here they call them barishingas. And it's the same species, but they're adapted to hard ground habitat. And I always like to get a picture where they're dripping. And this is the kind of picture I wanted to take of a Bengal tiger. You know, you ever heard that, stay out of the long grass? <laughs> well, that's why you want to stay out of the long grass. And uh, they're beautiful to see with their orange and white coats and they're striped with black. Tigers are top carnivores with large canines, massive paws and sharp claws and a large muscular body. Tigers are holding their own in the national parks. Now, if those of you that have traveled to see animals and birds, have you ever been where it's lions and jaguars and leopards and tigers? Uh, and you're in Jeeps and they hear about a tiger, what are you gonna do? You're gonna speed off to find out where the tiger is. And as a birder, I don't like that. So here's what I wrote. I've been get, uh, being accused of being too bird centric. It is true, I'd rather see a new bird than sit around watching a top carnivore sleeping or on their back with bloated bellies after last night's kill, immobilizing them for hours. But it's more than that. The pace and focus of the safari it's not a birder's pace. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And um, it, of carefully and stealthily approaching the wildlife. Valuable time was spent rushing to see the tiger and, and rather than enjoying all the wildlife. And because I had a Jeep all by myself with three Indian guides, a driver and two guides, I could often say, I don't want to stay here. And we drive around and we saw birds all the time. But there was this one place we stopped for uh, urination, and while I was waiting for the guy that had gone over to talk to a ranger, and I'm all by myself with three Indian guides, a great big jeep came up with a lot of Indians, and they weren't speaking English, and they were all chattering and pointing at me, and then the only words I understood in a question mark was, Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, no, and they laughed themselves silly, you know. And I just wish there was more of a balance. And I just want to say that because it's never going to happen. Because the uh, majority of the people, I like to call them fang and claw people. And that's why they're there. But, you know, the neat thing is, is that what they start to find out is that they really want to enjoy the safari. <clears throat> they want to stick with the birder because the birder is seeing something all the time. When I was in Botswana, they were... Uh, you know, we, we saw lots of animals. It's a beautiful place to go, but we saw more birds. And so one morning, right before we got in the Jeeps and we had to travel six hours through an old salt lake, they said, oh, Larry, what do you want to see today? Because, you know, I was studying for what other birds was. And I said, oh, I want to see a Cory Buster. How many have seen a Cory Buster? That is a big bird, isn't it? And so we're driving along. And after about two hours, the Cuban next to me hits me on the shoulder and points and said, there it is, the hairy bastard. <laughs> and I said, oh, you were really close. <laughs> um, we saw a racket-tailed uh, drongos, uh, and this one had lost its twisted tail rackets, and a white sh rumped shama, and uh, it reminded me of magpies. And in my room, there was this picture, and I took a picture of it because I liked it so much. And it's by uh, Todd Gustafson. And I really wanted a photo of a Langer doing a handstand. 
like that. And one of the cool things is that they, they, they came along and there was a water hole and there were a few animals, but I said, can we just sit here? And we sat there for 45 minutes and we saw tons. And that's because we were doing what birders do. Because we're a superior species, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want to tell you about the trip because remember, we, we were supposed to go in February. We didn't go until late March and into April, which is the height of the dry season and the heat. And the uh, temperature was 118 degrees Fahrenheit with the ground temperature of 143 degrees. You see the black and the white? Yeah, that's where we were. <laughs> and um, I want to say something here because I think all of you would agree that the climate is definitely changing. But here's one of the consequences to think about. Climate change will likely affect this country of 1.2 billion people with potentially catastrophic impacts on their crops and economy and means their livelihood and their lives. The question is, what if the dry season's hotter and longer? What if the monsoon season is wetter or doesn't arrive some years? Uh, the year I was there was the year that the monsoons were wetter and 30% of Pakistan was underwater. Yeah, but talk about hot. Okay, so here's the question, you know, we had a game drive that started about five in the morning, ended about 10 o'clock. And by the time we got back, it was uh, a lunch. And then we had the whole afternoon before we got back in the Jeeps at four and stayed till dusk, you know, till dark. So what do you do in the, between those guides? And uh, a lot of the people went and took a nap. And I'm at an age where if I take a nap during the day, I'm not sleeping at night. So I was going to read a book and work on my photographs, and a hooded oriole showed up in the window at my lodge, because I was always by myself. I love being by myself. And I said, well, I got to get out there. In 118 degree heat, I went out, and I saw some gray langers, and there were birds moving around, but there's a great big tiki hut, and it's in the shade, and there were seats in there. And there was a person that worked for the lodge that was going around to these different little water faucets and he was watering the plants so they didn't die. And then he'd go to the next water faucet and the next water faucet. So I could sit there like a 30 foot wide photograph blind. Mm. And um, so you want to see what I saw? Look at that spotted dove. Isn't that nice? Red vented bubbles. Mm. Oh, by the way, my red Bennett Bobo Lifebird, McDonald's, downtown Honolulu, okay? <laughs> in the McDonald's, okay? And then look at that orange-headed thrush. That's a gorgeous bird, isn't it? And Jordan's leap bird, and Tickle's blue flycatcher. And when I showed the guide at dinner, you know, he said, what did you do? I said, well, I took pictures. And I showed them because some of them, I didn't know what they were. And he goes, I haven't seen those birds. So guess what? I wasn't by myself the next day. And remember, most of the people were fang and claw people, and they were talking, hanging outside the hut. And uh, Lex, my friend, said, oh, I'm so sorry this has happened. I said, don't worry. They won't show up the next day. They didn't. And I was right back to seeing the jungle babblers and the Indian gray hornbill and the purple sunbird and the Indian jungle crow. Just by itself. Don't you like saying jungle crow? <laughs> and the copper smith barbette, male with food, and the female in her nest cavity. Now, this was given to me by the guide, Urku Khan, uh, Urku Babu Khan. And uh, I said, I never could get a good picture. And he says, they're in my front yard. So he sent me these oh. pictures from India. It's a neat, it's a little bird, not, not too big um, house finch size, a little thicker. And the Indian pitta, that's like a star bird in India. And the guide had never seen one because he always brought his people in February. And we were coming so late, there were pittas singing um, from the treetops. And that's in a sal tree, S-A-L. It's a very common tree there. And it seems to... Uh, weather the really dry and then really wet and uh, I thought uh, a, mon a montage of it would be really nice it's a pretty bird 
and it sang. And then red jungle fowl. You know, you really think you're out there in the wild and you hear cock a doodle doo. <laughs> and that is the uh, uh, the barnyard predecessor. And then we saw a little jungle fowl chick, just like you'd see a peep. And it was running around by itself. And about a quarter of a mile away, I saw a jackal. And I go, well, good luck, little chick. <laughs> and then we did uh, two night drives. And we saw a fair amount of tigers then. But the one I was impressed with was the leopard. Uh, the cattle can go anywhere they want. And this young one went on to the, uh, the national park. And this leopard caught it. And I was impressed with its jaws because, you know, like 50 feet away, you could hear the bones snapping. And about 100 feet away, you could see some golden jackals waking their turn. You know? Yeah, really nice. And then we went to the last lodge. It was uh, the Kana Jungle Lodge. And it was actually my favorite. And we stayed there six days, which was great. Uh, this is a typical Jeep hood brunch. You could get a quick, you know, snack at breakfast, but then you're on, you're just driving around because you're wasting time because that's when you're going to see a lot of animals. And here's the Balicki family Jeep. And Trevor had a knack for finding uh, tigers. And Shelly was a great photographer. The leopard picture was <laughs> Shelly's. And here's a gray langer with young. Don't you like the young's little unibrow? Yeah. yeah, really nice. And they keep a lot of contact. And when you see a troop, it's pretty well related uh, langers. Here's a crested uh, hawk eagle and a red-headed vulture. We saw lots of different raptors. And here's a shikra. And that is Indian's version of a cooper saw. And this one was uh, next to the nest they were in. Of course, we weren't close or anything. I had a nice telephoto lens. And then a little jungle owlet, about the size of our screech owls. And then here's that Indian peacock in its favorite perch. Uh, it was there every day we went by. I went five days. It was in the same perch the whole time. And males are called peacocks. Females are called peahens. And together, they're called peafowl. I was, I'm doing a talk right now. Uh, I'm the educational outreach coordinator for Wake Audubon, and we're doing birds of prey. When you get a bunch of vultures together, what do you call it? Vultures. Yeah, a bunch <laughs> of vultures. Okay, how about a committee? If they're swirling around in the air, they're called a, this is easy, you know this, a kettle. But what do you call it if they're feeding on something? Go ahead. Awake. Awake. Isn't that nice? Yeah. And then here's um, a Bengal tiger just seconds after a kill. And um, I didn't see it because guess what? I was somewhere looking at birds, but they were really jazzed about the fact that they saw an actual kill. It's not common. What they were doing is they were watching, they were on a little rise and they could see a uh, Bengal tiger in the grass. And it was way down in the cover. And here comes a spotted deer. Doo, 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 doo. And everybody's super quiet. And all of a sudden, it sprang four seconds. It zigged when it should have zagged. And you heard a little scream, and it was all over. And they talked about the rest of the time. And I go, you know, I don't really care about tigers. <laughs> and here's a Bengal tiger cooling her rear. And I like the reflection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here's a scarlet minivet. Mm. Makes our uh, Oriole look a little drab, doesn't it? And uh, the females are mostly yellow. And then here's an Indian cuckoo. And their song sounded like crossword puzzle. <laughs> and I like any bird that you can remember. And I can remember a crossword puzzle. And here's that black hooded oriole that got me out of just laying around my uh, cabin. And an oriole magpie robin. And they once considered it a thrush, but they're now considering it a uh, flycatcher. And it's really a lively, perky bird. Uh, the common mina, and it's, you see how it's all fur? He's on top of guar. And then here's the Indian roller. And they prefer trees and fences to hunt their insect prey. Uh, here's a cotton pygmy goose. Mm. I really am into pygmy goose because this goose is smaller than a mallard duck. Isn't that great? And uh, here's a little grebe. 
And uh, it reminded me a lot of pie bill greaves because you see the floppy butt, but the bill's all wrong, isn't it? And it was a, a great diver. It was in a pretty deep pond and would go down and stay down for quite a while. Here's the Barashinga swamp deer. And the barking deer, also called an Indian muntjac. And this small secretive deer fights other males with tusks, downward pointing uh, canines. And do you see how the deer's tensed up? Remember the couple that never got quiet? They were talking right next to it. You know, I was thinking when we're near a tiger, if they fell out, you know. <laughs> and uh, here's an Indian thick knee. Uh, and females incubate the leg, eggs on the ground with the male standing guard nearby. And they're nidifugus chicks that are downy and quickly colored and follow the parents soon after hatching. <laughs> means they follow the young. I mean, they follow their parents almost immediately when they... Um, precocial would be a word we'd recognize. But I just wanted to show off I knew what an Indian was. <laughs> and you see the Indian uh, tiger on alert? What he's alerted to is the park rangers are coming on their four-leg drives. And uh, I don't know why, but, he, you know, of course the tiger's not going to hang around because it really doesn't like elephants. And uh, once they moved on, it came back because in order to have a pool of water where they can get a nice drink during the dry season, they make concrete ponds and they fill it up and they come and lay in it and drink. And that's why it was easy to find them. Uh, there were little cormorants and they were little, about 20 inches in length. And here's a troop of gray langurs. And the troop relies on cover to escape predators like tigers and leopards. And this is my favorite ibis of all time. Isn't that a cool looking ibis? Uh, and um, doesn't it look like it lived in a monastery? <laughs> doesn't it? And the interesting about this one is you would see it away from water because it could be found in dry uh, fields a good distance from water. And then this is Indian honeybees. They're about six to eight feet across and they would hang on the underside of massive limbs. And you see that golden little dots? Every one of them's a bee. And you're probably asking yourself, doesn't that break off limbs? Well, where we were parked in a recent time, it, it had taken a whole branch down and there were smashed honey gum on the ground. Isn't that something? And then the oriental darter. I think darter is better than anhinga. And uh, it swims submerged. It has wettable feathers. It has to dry on a perch with the wings outstretched. And here's the. Uh, I started my. Uh, I started my uh, Apple phone on a timer. When I got in a jeep to come home, and I stopped it when I stepped on the front door. Continuous travel, 36 hours, 50 minutes, and 18 seconds, wow. and the end. <laughs> have you ever wondered if, if how langurs sit on the ground? They have little pads. And uh, here are the people that uh, let me photographs. Most of them are mine. You see the young with the SARS cream <laughs> and the bull elephant. And notice that he's leaking uh, pharaohs and uh, Lex. Shelly and Ikar Bablu Khan. Okay, I think that's it. <coughs> so, do you have any questions? I know that was fairly long. Yes? Wasn't. They ha it's not a very big horn. Uh, and uh, poaching there is just about zip because they have a common agreement in the area that this is a wonderful animal and they want to leave them alone. Yeah, I've seen rhinos in Africa where they cut the horns off for good reason. Anybody else? Yes. Just an observation for a fellow who professes not to like tigers. You have a lot of pictures of tigers. Oh, yeah, my friends, though, that's all they took pictures of. Uh -huh. Yeah. Your friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I think it was a split build stork. What is that? Yeah, mean? open build. Open build. Yeah, and it, it has a way of eating specific prey. If it was flat, it couldn't do it. And I believe it was snails that they can reach and pull them out because of the, like tweezers instead of chopsticks. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, I tell you, if you ever want to go to India, uh, I highly recommend it. Yes. Who uh, organized the tour that you went on? Uh, the tour group that I've used for several different places is called EcoQuest. Mm -hmm. And it's run by a man called Dave Davenport. And in fact, they have a trip to India in February. And I'll bet there's still spots. I'm not shilling for Dave Davenport, but um, he has an encyclopedia, uh, a cyclopedia uh, memory of things. Mm -hmm. And he's traveled all over the world. He wears out passports. <laughs> you know, and uh, he's really good at running us along. And uh, if Dave says it's this certain bird and I say it's another bird, Dave's right. Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> with the uh, African rhinos, they don't cut off the horns anymore because the mothers can't defend the babies against jackals. Okay. So when jackals swarm them, they can't do anything except bottom. Huh. And so the babies aren't safe. <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, when I was there... They did it. Yeah, they did it. They may have. And, and it was close to a human population. And, and like the, the, the rhinos, the only people that are allowed in the park, they're very strict, are a set number of jeeps that can go in. And they have to be out by a certain time. Um, there are uh, Asian elephants that are domesticated. You can see them washing them and, and working with them. It's pretty neat. So yes. You're saying they don't have a lot of problems with poachers at all. Oh, I'm not saying they don't have any problems, but it isn't like it is in Africa where a neighboring country that's unstable will send in, well, they don't send them in, but they come in because the risk they feel is worth the reward. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know what they've done with poachers to get them down to a, a, a much small number. They shoot them on sight now. Oh, okay. You know, you talking about in India or in Africa? Africa. Oh, good. India, we never had a conversation about that. Okay. Well, hey, thanks a lot. Thank you. Sorry, right. thanks for coming and a uh, small memento for your uh, speaking to us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.